The internet has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we work, the way we shop, and even the way we date. It has also changed the way we kill. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm on a quest to explore the dark side of our online world, where one click can lead to murder. The internet and social media has been a godsend to online predators. Why? Because of the speed in which they can, one, create fake profiles, but two, access victims. I'll be investigating some of the most disturbing crimes in recent history, where the internet and social media have been used to trick, torture and kill innocent victims lured into a virtual world where nothing is as it seems. Clearly, she did not realise the person she was talking to online was the man who was going to kill her. In this programme, 19-year-old Tony Bushby weaved a web of lies on social media to ensnare fellow student Katie Briscoe. Katie believed what she'd read about him online, but he repaid her trust by stabbing her to death in a frenzied attack. Why did Bushby mislead and then murder the girl who loved him? And how easy is it to manipulate social media to get inside people's minds with potentially fatal results? We're all using social media more and more every second. There are 1.8 billion on Facebook, with another 500,000 joining every day. Increasingly, we build and maintain our social circles through Facebook friend requests and contacts we meet in the virtual world. When Tony Bushby took a liking to fellow student Katie Briscoe, the teenagers got to know each other online. But the real Tony Bushby wasn't everything he seemed. On Boxing Day 2011, he visited Katie while she was babysitting her young niece and nephew. And when he arrived armed with a knife, poor Katie didn't stand a chance. The way that I saw her, I'd never ever want to see that again. I can't describe it because words cannot describe it at all. I'm on my way to Bournemouth in Hertfordshire, where Katie Briscoe lived and died. And I want to find out why she fell for Tony Bushby, a tragic mistake that was to cost her her life. Katie Briscoe was a popular church-going teenager and a talented artist. Although she didn't drink or go out partying, she loved having fun and being around her friends. Katie was a very quiet girl. She was always pleasant, always smiling and happy. She just was quiet and peaceful. If I could describe Katie in one word, I would say she's an angel. She likes to express herself through drawing. And most of the stuff that she drew was so alive. You know, unexpressive. She wanted to do children's book, do the covers and illustrate the covers for children's book. They yeah, could see that she's really at the um, extra gift. She'd be down there doing her own drawing, sketching. Even from that early age, you could see that's what she wanted. Like any typical teenager, Katie lived much of her life through social media. She was always on there. 
from she comes in from college until uh, sometimes one, two in the morning. She was on it every day. But the online world isn't always what it appears to be. And Katie's quiet, trusting nature would eventually lead to her death. In 2010, Katie started a foundation course in illustration at this college, the West Hertfordshire College of Art and Design. And it was here where she first met Tony Bushby. Tony was from a broken family. He no longer had any contact with his father, who divorced from his mother when he was at primary school. Tony outwardly would be seen as a normal, everyday teenager, very involved in social networking. And um, he, he had friends uh, at college. Um, and most people described him as um, uh, sometimes a bit of a loner, but also as, as uh, someone that they would be, wouldn't harm a fly. Katie and Bushby both lived in Boreham Wood, and it, it's likely that they both caught the bus to West Hertfordshire College in Watford, which is a few miles away. It may be that that's how they met and got to know each other. Katie and Bushby were on similar courses, and their paths overlapped on a daily basis. From there, it grew into a friendship, where they would text each other and message each other on Facebook. Tony and Katie's relationship progressed pretty quickly online, and it appears from their Facebook exchanges that he asked her out on their very first date to the cinema in April 2011. But it doesn't appear that Katie told her friends or family about Bushby, and it seems that Bushby never told his friends about Katie. This started out as a very secret romance. I didn't know that Katie had a boyfriend because Katie had never discussed boyfriends. I think when Katie met Tony Bushby, for some unknown reason, I realise now, at the time I didn't, that she was keeping secrets for him. And I didn't know why, but I knew that there was a change in her. I couldn't understand why she never talked to me about it. Although she had a very good relationship with her mother, sister and friends, when they asked about her boyfriend, she would often be fairly quiet, just say that things were OK, but would never elaborate in more detail. Clearly, when it gets to six months into a relationship uh, and parents, friends, have no idea about the other person, where they have no insights, where there's nothing shared, this is very unusual. It's very unusual for young people not to actually share information about their latest boyfriend, etc. Um, this is something that must have been a bit of a red flag. So why might Katie have decided to keep her relationship with Bushby a secret? Teenagers are always afraid of other people's reactions to any relationship, um, especially adult reactions, their parents' and step-parents' reactions. Katie, let's not forget, was a good girl. She was church-going and, and a very home-based girl. She might want to have some privacy and not tell the world about their relationship. She could also have been a very private person who didn't want to shout about this initial first flourishing relationship she had. Though Katie played along with it, it seems likely that the desire for secrecy came from Bushby initially, who may already have had a sinister motive. The grooming process really, for me, began straight away. He identified Katie as a victim. And the minute they accepted or she accepted him as an online friend, that is the process beginning. Katie and Bushby had dozens of dates in the woodlands around here. They exchange hundreds of text messages online and they appear to have a flourishing relationship. But beneath the innocent exterior, Bushby may already have had murder on his mind. I think that Bushby always had a plan to harm uh, Katie. Um, this, this was something that perhaps didn't have absolute form, but certainly the intent was planned there before the relationship started. Mm -hmm. 
Joy Davis tragically lost her daughter Katie just after Christmas 2011. Katie was brutally murdered by her boyfriend Tony Bushby on Boxing Day as she looked after her sister's two young children. For Joy, it's a memory that will never leave her. There was something that I would never like to experience again, to know that I'm never ever going to see my daughter again. I'm never ever going to see her again. And the way that I saw her, I'd never ever want to see that again. Katie Briscoe and Tony Bushby's relationship was far from typical. They kept their relationship a firmly guarded secret. Katie may not have been talking to her friends and family about the relationship, but she was talking to someone about it. In fact, she was speaking to four people. Four friends of Bushby contacted her after the start of the relationship, saying that they'd heard she was Tony's new girl and could they be Facebook friends. But who really were these people? There were two girls, Sin Darwin and Crystal Stangard, and two boys, Shane Pluon and Dan Tress. Katie and Bushby spoke to each other on, online and he introduced them to her as Facebook friends and she had individual conversations with them. All four friends messaged Katie through Facebook to tell her about Bushby. Dan Tress told Katie that he and Bushby were involved in drug dealing together. And Sin Darwin told Katie that she and Bushby had been in a relationship. They said he was uh, a nice guy, um, he was fun, friendly, and, and of course, um, that would have influenced Katie to believe he was a safe individual and a safe person to go out with. She could trust him. But disturbingly, all the time that Katie was talking to these four friends, she had no idea that things weren't quite what they seemed. Dan, Crystal, Shane and Sin were all fictitious friends created by Tony all the time. The person typing the words out, pretending to be Dan Tress, of the three other friends, was Bushby himself. She was unaware that they'd all been created from, from his own IP address. Clearly, she did not realise the person she was talking to online was the man who was going to kill her. Why would Bushby choose to invent these four fake friends and then use them to converse with Katie through Facebook? This adds to his own credibility that so they can talk about him or he's talking about himself. And you bring in these four different characters, two women, two men, to talk about Tony, what sort of person he is. One who's actually had a relationship with him. So every area is covered. Then you've got the, the, the drug taker, the area of life that's a bit sinister. So he's creating a whole fantasy world around him to impress, to control. There's a vulnerable victim. It's likely that Bushby was using the fake profiles to help him win Katie over and to gain her trust. But just how easy is it for people to pretend to be someone they're not in the digital universe? I'm just making a fake Facebook profile here of uh, a guy called Jason Brown. He's about 20. He's, uh, <laughs> one of my work colleagues sons and obviously I look nothing like him and the world I inhabit and the social world I inhabit would obviously involve very few 20 year olds. So within effectively two or three minutes I've been able to create uh, an email address for Jason Brown age 20. I've been able to create a Facebook profile not a problem so now I can operate very effectively you know as a 20 year old uh, with a peer group uh, anything from um, 16 uh, to 25. To create a fake profile within any social media site is, is minutes work. But what isn't minutes work is how you carry on with that profile, how you become that person. Where does he get the images from? What sort of life have they got? Are they local? If I was Tony Bushby, I would now create a number of other 
fake profiles to bolster my reputation, to build me as a character, somebody worth knowing, somebody maybe worth falling in love with. It's quite clear, this is absolutely the epitome of the very modern murder. This murder could not have taken place outside the era of social media. The internet and social media has been a godsend to online sexual predators. Why? Because of the speed in which they can, one, create fake profiles, but two, access victims. You've got something in common straight away, and what's that? You're on Facebook together. And if you've got a public profile, then you can see each other. These are the interesting things about social media and what it's done to facilitate uh, online sexual predators or any uh, online predator because of what it allows, and that is access and opportunity to possible victims. With connections made online more and more in our digital world, Katie didn't suspect anything was amiss, and she accepted each of the friend requests from Bushby's aliases without a second thought. Her trusting personality led her to believe all the wonderful things these friends said about him. But why wasn't she more suspicious? For anybody that's able to sit outside this like us and look at it, alarm bells are all over the place. But then, for Katie, this was her perhaps her first relationship that she was having. She wanted everything to be true. She wanted Sin to be real. She wanted Dan Tress to be real. And of course, she knew Tony was real because she saw him. So the alarm bells start to be silenced. Intrigued by the things she was hearing about him online, Katie had fallen for Bushby's lies. It would prove to be a tragic mistake. Katie never suspected that Tony's friends, who were telling her what a wonderful guy he was, were a complete fabrication. And of course, they never told her that the guy she was falling for had a dark side. He'd been looking at pornographic and violent rape websites. One of them was called Ebony Submission, which involved the abuse of black women. It is violent rape scenarios. It is the kind of pornography that most people would find distasteful. Even individuals who like pornography would find it distasteful. Um, but it shows that deep within him there is a sadistic sexual need. He wants to enact this. He is finding it extremely arousing. Bushby was able to watch extremely violent pornography on his laptop in his bedroom, while at the same time having a Facebook Messenger conversation with Katie. And of course, Katie was completely unaware of what he was doing. So that shows his ability to compartmentalise and box off the good parts of his personality and the dark parts. I also imagine that Bushby himself got some kind of kick and thrill out of having the communications with Katie and her being completely oblivious and unaware of what was happening at the same time in his bedroom. His experience of watching, searching for, and looking for extreme pornography involving girls, black girls, you've got her gender, you've got her race, everything about her for him was what he wanted and desired. So therefore there's a very high probability that he was associating the images he was seeing on ebony porn with Katie. While Bushby was watching violent rape porn and inventing four fake friends to reel Katie in, she innocently believed there was nothing untoward with their internet relationship. It's part of the modern world that people of all ages and sexual orientations search for love online. But is remote romance fraught with danger? Is it all just too easy for someone like Bushby to deceive when all that can be seen is what they're writing? I'm meeting with criminologist Dr Elizabeth Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry to try to gain more of an insight into Tony Bushby's mind. What distinguishes his actions out as a potential murderer? 
I don't think we can point to what he was doing online and say he was definitely going to go and commit murder from, from looking at these things. But here we've got somebody who's a fantasist and there's that very blurry line between fantasy for him and reality for him and that's when we get into the danger zone. I mean, one of the key red flags in all of this is the fact his habit of watching, you know, violent racial porn, rape porn. Do you think that's why he selected her? Well, I think he's got that fantasy world going on in the background, hasn't he? And I think Bushby has really blurred that, that fantasy and reality. So he has these images of, of women that he's seeing in, in these videos that he's watching. And then in real life, there's Katie. And the fact that he can control her, that she's black, she's quite innocent, means he can do what he wants with her. So what moved it on? So, I mean, if that wasn't the objective, and it appears that it was so constructed and premeditated, these fake profiles celebrating what a fantastic guy Bushby was, right? I mean, what else did he have in mind if it wasn't to kill her? Well, I think it was to completely control her and to, to get what he wanted out of her. And, and then he would move on from there. Just after Christmas 2011, college student Katie Briscoe was brutally stabbed to death by her boyfriend, Tony Bushby. Tony Bushby went to this college with Katie Briscoe. He invented four fictitious friends on Facebook to convince her to fall in love with him. And it worked perfectly. She wants everything to be real. She wants these people to exist. She believes they exist. So, unfortunately, in this area, when you start to look at the control that uh, Tony had, alarm bells would have been silenced at an early stage. Just before Christmas 2011, Bushby used one of his Facebook aliases to set up a meeting between Katie and an imaginary ex-girlfriend called Sim. He used a SIM card from his sister's old phone, apparently in an attempt to cover his tracks as he lured Katie to this deserted location. What was on Bushby's mind? What was he planning? It's a very strange location. You would expect, if you were going to meet a friend of your boyfriend, you'd go to a pub or to a cafe, not to some wood on the outskirts of the town. Needless to say, Sin didn't turn up. Bushby had met Katie in the woods supposedly so he could introduce her to Sin. But of course, he knew all along that there was no possibility of Sin coming. So why did he do it? Perhaps he intended to rape Katie, reenacting the violent porn he'd been watching online. Or maybe he planned to murder her, but when it came to it, changed his mind. It looks likely that he was planning on doing Katie some harm that night. And it was only because Katie had said to him, that her sister knew where she was going and that she was with Bushby, that perhaps he decided not to kill her there and then. We can't know for sure whether Bushby intended to kill Katie in the woods or whether it was just a trial run. What's certain is that Bushby was very keen to arrange another meeting as soon as possible. And this time, he contacted her as himself. On the day of the killing, which was Boxing Day, Katie was looking after her sister's two young children. Her sister had gone out for the night. And she'd had conversations with Bushby on the Christmas day. What's interesting, of course, is that Katie, on Boxing Day, when a lot of teenagers might have gone out with their friends, had chosen to help her sister out. That evening, Bushby twice tried to call Katie, at 7.48 p.m. and again at 8 o'clock. Hi, Tony. He Hi, finally got through at 8.13. The third time that Bushby called Katie, she picked up, and they spoke for 25-plus minutes. No, I just bought a pizza. Pepperoni, of course. This was long enough for Bushby to make inquiries as to what Katie was doing exactly. To establish that Katie was alone in the house babysitting with two small children and that she was not going to be visited by anyone that evening. Yep, it's just me. 
Yeah, I'm here all night. After this phone call, Bushby goes home. He tells his mother he's picking up his ID so he could go to the pub, but in fact, he was probably picking up the knife. On Boxing Day night 2011, Tony Bushby left his house here on this street to take a short half a mile walk to Katie's sister's house across the river. Now, he'd be walking in this direction on a night not too dissimilar to this. And I have to wonder, what was going through his mind as he set off on this short walk? Had he already decided that the time had come to murder Katie? He was clearly very focused. He was able to collect the knife that he needed to, to kill her. He collected that from his bedroom. He was able to contact Katie just before he called on her to make sure that she was still essentially on her own and that the coast was clear. Hey, Casey, it's, uh, it's me again. Are you, are you uh, like, still alive? I told you I was here till tomorrow. So this is an individual that was thinking on his feet and thinking very clearly. He'd taken gloves along with him as well. He was wearing black clothing. This was an individual who had murder in mind. Tony Bushby arrived at Katie's sister's house here on the street around 9 p.m. on Boxing Day night. She had no reason to suspect he was about to murder her. What the police know is that the last time Katie was online was at 9.14 p.m. on Boxing Day night. Shortly after that, Bushby arrived at the house. Tony, what are you doing here? I have to talk to you about something. My sister will go crazy if I let you in. Within a short space of time, he'd launched the attack. I think he had to do that very quickly because if he spent any time in her company or had a drink and relaxed, he might lose the urge to kill that he'd probably been building up on his way over there on foot. Agonizingly, as Katie lay dying, her mother and sister were both trying to call her to check that she was okay. When Bushby attacked Katie and she was dying, we know that Katie's sister was calling the landline to try and see if Katie was OK and to see how things were. Katie's sister was leaving a number of messages on the answer phone, and these would have been playing loudly within the house. Katie, Katie, you... Bushby, no doubt, would have heard Katie's sister's voice asking if she was OK. This, of course, might have spooked Bushby and might have made him leave the property because somebody else could have been coming around to check on Katie because nobody had heard of her. We kept on ringing. And every half an hour, me and my daughter kept on ringing, and we got no reply, and I got concerned. I started panicking, cos I was doing a sleepover at the place where I work, and I kept on ringing every 10 minutes or so, and my other daughter kept on doing the same, and we kept on discussing with herself, why doesn't she pick up, you know? So we rang the house phone, we rang her mobile, and we kept on ringing. But with Katie's mother at work and her sister away for the night, neither were able to go to the house to check on her. After a while, say about 12.30, my daughter rang me again and said to me, I know they, um, maybe they're all asleep and stuff like that because um, uh, the, ch the children was already tucked up in bed and stuff like that. But um, 
She said, when you finish work tonight, tomorrow, could you just go around there? And I just went around there as a precaution, just to set, put my daughter's um, mind at rest. As soon as she got off work the next morning, Joy drove straight to the house to see if Katie was all right. I noticed that the light was on in the sitting room. And I thought, that is strange in broad daylight. Then I heard my two grandchildren talking. And from the way they were talking and their voice, I could tell that they were, they have been up for hours. And I found that very strange. So straight away, I saw blood on the door. So I said with a voice, open the door and let grandma in, as though I'm smiling in a friendly manner. And just before, as soon as they opened the door, she said, Katie's dead. I thought to myself, I wonder if Katie had an accident, you know? Then as soon as I stepped inside, I saw her on the floor with her throat cut and blood everywhere. Katie had been stabbed 23 times. The most severe injuries were to her neck and a stab wound to the stomach that penetrated her vital organs. Defensive wounds on her hands showed that Katie had tried desperately to fight for her life. Although he didn't sexually assault her in any physical way, some of the stabs, particularly to her upper thighs, were no doubt sexual in nature, and the sites where he attacked her were sexual. He didn't stab her from the back, he stabbed her from the front, and that's often a very sexually motivated way to approach a victim. I tried to pick her up thinking I'm gonna take her to the hospital, and um, I realized that she was stiff. And straight away, I thought about my two grandkids behind me, watching me, because they was watching, waiting for my reaction. And I decided that the best thing is to turn around, walk out the room with them, to take them away from that scene. I, I had to take them away from that scene. It was just too graphic, you know. And I felt as though um, I needed to protect them. Joy called the police and they arrived within minutes. I went round there and the forensic people wouldn't let me in. And she was inside, but they said, no, you've got to stay out here because we're having tests and everything like that. And um, I just I just burst out crying after that. It was so emotional, I just shed tears, whatever. I just literally um, unfolded from there. I can't describe it, because words cannot describe it at all. Like me, some experts believe that Bushby always planned to murder Katie. But do Mike Barry and Dr Liz Yardley agree? Mike, uh, was this a spontaneous killing or was this something premeditated and planned? I don't think he intended to murder her. I think quite clearly he intended to work out his rape fantasies on her. I think the murder was a byproduct when it went wrong. I think he realised that whilst he could create the fantasy Tony through his online personas, he couldn't create the fantasy Katie, could he? He couldn't get what he wanted in that regard. Also, the other problem is that people don't work out the consequences of the fantasy. And that's clear in this case because he had no idea about disposal of body and things like that. If he was planning to kill her, he would have had the sense to look at disposal. So you think he wasn't a killer in waiting, this was a killer tipped over the edge by circumstance? I think what's happened is that at some point during the evening that Katie died, he's lost control. And that, that frenzied attack on her is his attempt to gain some control back. I think it's quite clearly a spontaneous killing, but he had the ideas in his head of the violence and everything else. So it's opportunistic that it happened that day, or tragic for the poor Katie, but he hadn't planned to go and kill her that moment, I don't think. You know, we, we have to agree to disagree, but I think the ultimate form of control is to take someone's life. I think he planned it, he was prepared for it, and then he perpetrated it. With the help of social media and a series of fake Facebook profiles, Tony Bushby successfully lured Katie Briscoe into a relationship before brutally stabbing her to death 
on Boxing Day 2011. Some of the stab wounds Bushby had inflicted on Katie's body suggested a clear sexual motive for the murder. But it seems Bushby's sexual desire wasn't satisfied when he left Katie dying on the kitchen floor. Bushby, after killing Katie, was no doubt in an extremely high state of arousal. And so he's rushed into the house with his adrenaline pump in his high. He immediately went straight upstairs, obviously removing bloodstained clothing and cleaning himself up. But we also know that within the hour, he was back online looking at extreme pornography again. <laughs> he's then put the movie on and put her profile on to look at her. This is the end result. Yes, I've actually achieved my fantasy, my want, my desire of actually being with and murdering a young black girl. He's committed the crime, he's highly aroused, and now he just needs to, to finish off that, that arousal that he's had. And then it's a question of how do I cover this up? How do I now get away with it, realising what he's done? It seems that as the reality of the murder began to dawn on Bushby, he went back online to look for ways to cover his tracks. He made Google searches. How to delete a Facebook account. We also know that he damaged his mobile phone in an attempt to stop people accessing the messages. That didn't work. He also put his clothes in a black bin bag and presumably the murder weapon and left them near some bins to be collected by the dustman. Bushby was captured on CCTV carrying a bag that police believe contained the murder weapon and the clothes he was wearing when he killed Katie. But they were never found. However, he wouldn't escape justice for long. Bushby's undoing would prove to be the very same social media he'd used to groom Katie early in their relationship. Bushby's level of forensic awareness was clearly clumsy. We all know you can't delete Facebook accounts, you can only deactivate them. That's always been the case. There's technology assisting law enforcement. So law enforcement come into it and they will be able to do all these forensic tests. They'll be able to do forensic tests on computers, on phones that they're going to find. He now knows it's a ticking time bomb till they get the evidence showing that it's him. Bushby was arrested here at his home later that day. Initially, he denied even ever knowing Katie. But under interview at the station, he suddenly changed his story. He told officers that the murder had been committed by one of his fictional Facebook profiles that he'd created, that of Dan Tress. Dan. Dan. Okay, yeah. Tell me about Dan. Okay, do you want his second name? That might be you out. said his name is yes. Dan Tress. Yeah. He immediately gives tremendous detail about his other persona. Uh, Dan uh, uh, meeting him for the first time. So how do you know him? How do I know him? I met him through my hobby of karate. He, does, he used to do it now and again, on and off. He was with um, another class. Uh, in London, operates in London. <laughs> um, something, uh, I wouldn't know be able to spell it, but it's Okuru. Uh, that's the name of the club. I don't know how to spell it. Okay. But it operates in London. My club operates in Burnwood and Hertfordshire. I think Bushby had lived with these fictitious people he'd made up for so long, he was kind of able to address them and address their personalities when he was relating this to the police. Shame, he was somebody who could possibly relate to these individuals sufficiently to be able to draw them in, to use them as his alibi, to actually produce a potential suspect for the police who was actually a fictitious character he'd made up himself. And they, of course, then investigated those names not realising at first that they were imaginary and false. 
Police studied Bushby's computer further and also examined the CCTV footage along the route between Katie's house and Bushby's home here. It soon became apparent that Bushby's story simply didn't stack up. Forensic officers also found Katie's blood on Bushby's door. He was spinning a web of lies and his four fictional friends were all part of the deception. When the police examined Bushby's computer, they found that the four characters, the four friends that he'd introduced to Katie were, were all created on his own IP address at his house. They all came from him. And that was a question he could never answer. He insisted that Dan Tress was responsible and that he was a victim of circumstance. He protested his innocence. Bushby was no stranger when it came to believing fantasies. And the more that he kind of believed his story about Dan Tress, the more it became a reality to him. Well, to me, that indicates that he has dissociated his identity with other identities. And there is a possibility that what they used to call multiple personality disorder, that he actually took on the role of those personalities when he was communicating online and became those individuals. And this splitting, or dissociative states, is a defence mechanism from which prevents people from psychological breakdown. Bushby pleaded not guilty to murder here at St Albans Crown Court in July 2012, but the evidence was clear-cut. The jury unanimously found him guilty as charged. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years to serve before being even considered for parole. When the judge sentenced him, he made it clear that he felt that the killing of Katie had a sexual motive. The 25-year sentence Bushby received reflects the terrible crime that he committed. The judge said that he poses and continues to pose a threat to women. Characters like Bushby are incredibly dangerous, and if Bushby had got away with the murder of Katie, I've got no doubt that that would bolster his confidence for him to do similar crimes again in the future. Criminologists categorise murder cases to try to prevent similar crimes happening again. So what type of murderer do Dr Elizabeth Yardley and Mike Berry think Bushby was? So Liz, from your research, what kind of online murder, what category would you put this in? Well, I definitely say that Bushby is a fantasist, but I think he's a fantasist who, who, who could have, have gone on to commit murder without the use of, of social media, without the internet in the background. This guy was controlling, he's got all the characteristics of somebody who's going to be dangerous. But I think it, it's what social media enabled him to do, was to fuel a fantasy, to keep a fantasy going, and that's, that's the key point for me. Having deconstructed this case, what precautions could have been taken to prevent this murder? Well, it's very difficult, isn't it, to, to really identify things in this case because we're looking at how young people use the internet, how young people use social media. They put a lot of trust in it, they put a lot of faith in it. And, and we can warn children and young people about online predators that they don't know in real life, people who are claiming to be something that they're not. But in this case, we've got somebody who's, who's already known to the victim. Is there any sense of instituting some rules to ensure that all online profiles are actually of real people? Might that not have prevented this murder? I think that's something that, that is absolutely fine in theory, but you try and make that happen in practice, and there will be people who don't want to have their identities known, so they will find a way around it. They'll start using other sites, other apps. You'll, you'll never be able to, to say that the people who you interact with on social media are who they say they are. So, Mike, what practical advice do you suggest to people forming relationships, looking for love online? I would take a very cynical view. Go for the old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, then it ain't true. And I think people have to adopt that one. And I'll make people think about adverts. Do you believe everything you see in an advert? And that's essentially what we're doing on social media. We're marketing ourselves online. We're never going to be our true selves. We're going to be the selves that we want other people to see. So you're getting a particular tailored product. You're not getting reality. I didn't investigate at all. And all the information was there for me to see if I had done. So some mothers 
who feel as though they could trust their kids and they wouldn't get into any trouble. They just have to in investigate a little bit more and find out more and monitor what they watch and what they use, who they're talking to. It's, if, it, if it can keep your children safe, it is worth it. It feels as though it's yesterday. It's a scary experience, one that you do not want to relieve, but it's always before you. And sometimes it is hard to move on from that um, day because from that day, my life has stopped. Being, my life has stopped being living. I'm only existing. I, I think I have to hold on to the fact that I've got two gorgeous grandkids that were spared. And I just want to be around them to see if I can protect them more than I did my own child. And that is it.